if you will make your way to your seats. No, you don't have eight seconds. You quit when I tell you to quit. Okay? This is the only place I have power right here. So I'm going to abuse that power because I don't have it at home. I, you get me. I know you get me. It's cool. We will use power where we can, won't we? Is that why you're out in the field all the time talking to yourself? Yeah, me too. So um, if you haven't seen the paper, uh, there is an article about us as a family and a church. So you might want to check that out, okay? Uh, it says some good stuff about us as a, as a congregation and as a church. Great uh, way to get our name out in the community. It was awesome. Whoever did the write-up about me made me sound way better than I am. So, wow. <laughs> Look, Rick, calm down, man. It was just joking about your shirt. <sighs> got to get them. So I got a... Um, a note under my do- door, my office door this week, and it's pretty serious, and I want to read it, okay? Somebody sent this and put it under my door, and it says, A very proper lady began planning a week's camping vacation for her and her Baptist church group. She wrote to a campground for reservations. She wanted to make sure that the campground was fully equipped and modern, but couldn't bring herself to write the word toilet in her letter. So she decided on the old fashionable term bathroom commode. Once she wrote that down, she still was uncomfortable. She still wasn't comfortable writing that. So she finally decided to abbreviate BC and wrote, does your campground have its own BC? When the campground owner received the letter, he couldn't figure out what she meant by BC. He showed it to several of the campers And one of them suggested that the lady obviously was referring to a Baptist church since there there was a letterhead on the paper that referred to a Baptist church. So he sent this reply. Dear Madam, the BC is located nine miles from the campground in a beautiful grove of trees. I admit it is quite a distance if you are in the habit of going regularly. No doubt you... (laughs) will be pleased to know that it will seat 350 people at one time. (laughs) It is open on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays of every week. Some folks like to take their lunch and make a day of it. The acoustics are very good, so everyone can hear even the quietest passages. It may interest you to know that my daughter met her husband there. We are also having a fundraiser to purchase new seats, as the old ones have holes in them. That's weird. Unfortunately, my wife is ill and has not been able to attend regularly. It's been a good six months she went, since she went last. It, <laughs> it pains her very much not to be able to go more often. As we grow older, it seems to be more of an effort, especially in cold weather. Perhaps I could accompany you your first time to go, sit with you, and introduce you to all the other folks who will be there. I look forward to your visit. We offer a very friendly campground, the camp director. I'm not sure who put that under my door. I think it was Gloria. I think it was Gloria Camp, because she circled the camp director. So that had to be Gloria. So I thought you should have to hear that, since I did. It's been a rough week for me. Um, I've been doing chemo. I'm supposed to do chemo for five days out of a month for a year. Um, and I think we're, what is this, two, week, two months now we're down? Two months? And the uh, first couple of days aren't bad, but you get into the third and fourth days, and it is excruciating. So uh, we canceled Wednesday night, and... I just pretty much laid around Thursday and didn't do anything. Did feel like Andrea wanted to take me to the emergency room, but I said, no, I'm a man. I will tough it out. <clears throat> uh, I gotta, 
We are in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. My title of the sermon for the summer, we're going to do a sermon series over this summer called Living in the Upside Down. Do you have that, that thing there, Josh? Living in the Upside Down. Those of you that are a fan of, uh, what is that show? Stranger Things. Who said Stranger Things? Who, yeah. Those of you that are a fan of Stranger Things know what we're talking about, the Upside Down. So, let's get to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verse, we're starting in verse 23. And we'll go through chapter 3 to verse 6. I'm reading the New Living Translation, so if you have that on your tablet or device or something, you can change over to the New Living Translation, and you can follow along, or you can look at the Sky Bible. That's what we call it in kids' church, the Sky Bible. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through the grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read the Scripture what David did when he and his companions were hungry. He went into the house of God during the days of Abathar with, was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Verse 27, Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. And we're going into chapter 3. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? They wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Father, I ask that you would help us to see your word in a way we've never seen it before. Open it up to us and help us to understand the meaning behind it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're starting a new series that will last throughout the summer. It's called Living in the Upside Down. And um, you're thinking, where did I get this weird text from? I'm not only a Star Wars fan, a Star Wars nerd, as most of you know that helped me move all my Star Wars stuff, and raffled through it like you were going to put it on eBay or something. I'm not only a Star Wars nerd, but I'm also a science fiction nut, so I love any kind of alien science fiction kind of stuff. You know, I love that stuff. I guess I'm, I've never grown up, and I probably never will. This is from a show on Netflix called Stranger Things. Now, Stranger Things is a sci-fi weird show that it's, there's something in it called The Upside Down. The Upside Down is an alternate dimension that is kind of parallel to our human world. So whatever you see in the human world and the upside down, everything is the exact opposite. So anything that's like nice and pretty is kind of nasty and messed up. So it's, it's called the upside down. Get it? Okay. Anybody know where we're going with this? We follow a man who is God, who teaches us that we are to live in the upside down. Culture tells us what? Culture tells us that we are to, uh, he, he, Jesus tells us to live counter to culture. He says, the culture tells us, you get what you can, you do all that you can, you get what you can for yourself, make yourself happy, do things to make yourself happy, make sure that you're taken care of, and then if you have time, you help other people. That's what culture tells us to do. If it's convenient, if it's, if it's the right time, if things go the way that you think they should go, if you're taken care of and your family's taken care of, then you help someone else. That's not the guy we follow. He teaches us the exact opposite. He teaches us that we are to live life for other people. We are to live life and give of ourselves. We are giving ourselves away. And he showed us how to do that when he died on the cross for our sins. 
He gave everything for us, and we are to give everything that we are for other people. We are to think less of ourselves and put everybody else's needs before our own needs. That's what the upside down is in our culture. Our culture doesn't live that way. They don't see that way. They don't think that way. They look at self, I, what I need, what I want in my life, what, what my family wants. And then, if it's convenient, I will help somebody else out. Jesus completely wrecks our social constructs and calls us to live in the upside down. It's not, it's not just in the culture, but it's also in religion. It's in religion. Jesus totally transformed everything that the religious belief establishment had in mind when he was on earth. The religious leaders had a mindset of how things should work. Jesus came in and wrecked it, wrecked it all. In fact, he was a marked man because they wanted to kill him for the good things that he had done for other people. And for Jesus, religion is not safe where Jesus is. You didn't know that you were getting a weird pastor. <clears throat> I realize that. You've bought into it now so that you, can't get, you cannot return it. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you don't want to. I'm a weird person. Uh, I'm not your average normal pastor. <laughs> don't roll your eyes. When I go out places, when, I go, when I'm not at church, well, even when I am at church, I don't dress like a pastor. I don't act like a pastor. I'm not prim and proper and, you know, I'm not your typical preacher. I like to dress in shorts and t-shirts and uh, usually some goofy Star Wars shirt or a Cobra Kai shirt from uh, the Karate Kid or something weird like that. And I go, I, the, the reason I do this is because when I meet people, I don't want them to get a preconceived notion of who I am. I don't want them to be like, oh, it's he, this guy must be a preacher, or he's like really thinks he's important, dressing up fancy, and I don't want to do that. I want people to be real with me. I want people to be honest with me. I was telling a couple guys a couple stories um, from when I lived in Tennessee. I went to a tattoo parlor with one of my friends who was getting a tattoo, and the guy that was given the tattoo for like three hours did nothing but badmouth churches and pastors and pastors' wives. And everything to do with church. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, please don't ask. Please don't ask what I do. Please don't ask what I do. What do you do for a living? <laughs> I was like trying to think up something, like I heard goldfish or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a pastor. And his jaw hit the floor. And he's like, you're a pastor. Oh, yeah, I'm, my uh, uncle was a pastor. Oh, yeah, I, you're really, yeah, I like church. I go to ch where, uh, What church do you go to? Well, it's, it's, you wouldn't know where it is. It's down the way somewhere. And, and it was interesting how, like, he didn't expect me to be a pastor. And he's sitting there mouthing off about pastors and pastors' wives, and, how, and I mean, he's cussing every other word's an F-bomb. And so then I go into a Walmart, and I'm looking for coolers for a youth event. I, had this, I wanted to get the biggest cooler I could, and I'm looking, and I'm measuring and seeing how long the ice will last in the cooler. And I'm getting it for this teen thing that we got going on. And this guy walks in the aisle, and that thing will hold a whole lot of beer, won't it? <laughs> I don't know, because I'm getting it for our church youth event. And he, like, he's, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I love when I don't look like a pastor and people say things to me because it, it kind of, like, they get vulnerable for a minute. They kind of, like, their, their, their guard drops. And they will say things to you that you, they probably wouldn't say to you if they thought you were a pastor, if they thought you were a preacher. I love what Jimmy's doing. Jimmy's doing something uh, for me because I gave the, the board a book to read. Uh, called Deep and Wide. It's about how the church is supposed to be, how the church needs to be more towards uh, people who are non-church believers, not church people. The church needs to look like that. That's what it needs to look like. And so Jimmy, I love what he's doing. He's going to people and he's not saying to them, do you have a relationship with Jesus? He asks them, do you go to church? He doesn't ask them about what they believe. He doesn't, and, and it's awesome because you're getting responses like crazy. He has a notebook. Now, you wouldn't put it in a phone because you don't have a phone. He has this notebook full of reasons that people have given him, and he's marking everybody that says the same thing. He marks it. 
And so he has a book, a notebook, full of reasons why people don't go to church. A lot of it is because they've been hurt by church people in the past. That's a big one. That's a real big one. And in fact, I guarantee you, you know people that will not come in here because of an experience they've had in the past that has hurt them. Someone has said something to them, have done something to them to make them feel like that they don't add up to what Jesus should be. And, and, and I love the, the opportunity that you're, Jimmy, you're getting an opportunity right now to, to share Jesus and you're making them think. When they walk away from Jimmy, guess what they're thinking? Why don't I go to church? Some of the people that he said that he interviewed, they say they don't go to church because they just don't go to church. They didn't grow up in that culture. They didn't grow up in a culture of going to church. If you've never done it, so my dad, my dad is not a hunter. He doesn't hunt. Because his dad didn't take him hunting. He didn't do hunting when he was a kid. He didn't grow up hunting. So he didn't go hunting when he, was, when he grew up to be an adult. That's the same way it happens in church. If they don't, you, you don't take your kids to church, you don't take your grandkids to church, and they don't have an opportunity, guess what? They never grow up knowing what church is like. So then why do they think they need to go to church? So I love the opportunity of, of getting outside of the box and thinking outside of the box the way Jesus thinks. He calls us to live in the upside down to where not even religion is safe. If you look at our story today, you see Jesus is hounded and his followers are hounded by these, these Pharisees, these people who think that they are religious. I'm talking to my neighbor and I'm really trying to... My neighbor found out that I was a pastor. I was really hoping he didn't think that I was, know that I was a pastor until I had an opportunity to talk a little bit to him because I didn't want him to close off his heart to me, to the Lord. I wanted to be able to talk freely with him. So he found out I was a pastor. He grew up Catholic. And he said to me, so you're one of those religious guys. And I said, I hope not. <laughs> he said, really? Why, what do you mean? And I said, I don't ha I'm not into religion. Religion tells me I have to do things. Re religion tells me I have to be a certain way. Jesus tells me what to do. And it's relationship. It's relationship. That's what it is. It's not about religion, because religion is about do, 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 don't do, don't do, don't do. What is Jesus, when the, when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, what's the greatest commandment, what does Jesus say to him? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love other people. That's what it's about. That is the greatest thing that Jesus can pull together from Scripture is to love God and love other people. Well, what about all? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't fall into those categories, it doesn't matter. Love God and love other people. And a lot of times what we do is we pull a Pharisee trick. Now, there's a Pharisee in all of us. So don't try to start pointing fingers at Pharisees in the Bible because we have the Pharisee tendency in ourselves. We do. We do. We love to point out other people's flaws and weaknesses. And it's easy to tell somebody to forgive somebody if, it's, if you don't have something to forgive. It's real easy to tell somebody to stop sinning in a certain way if you don't have that temptation. It's real easy. It's, it's, it's awesome. Oh, just walk up to somebody, you're dealing with this? You should let it go. Well, you've never dealt with that. How do you know? I have an, a cousin who is a transsexual. And my uncle, who is a pastor, that's his son, which now she's a female. She had a whole thing done, whatever. And there was somebody at a conference that he was at that was really bad-mouthing homosexuals. And he said, he said to that guy, he said, you know what? You would look at it totally different if it was your, your son. You'd look at it totally different if it was your kid. Now, my uncle never, he never says that homosexuality is not a sin. He, he, he down the line, he will say it. That homosexuality is a sin. But his heart for his kid changed because he deals with this. He's been praying for his kid. His kid believes that he is going to heaven when he dies. His kid believes that he has a heart that loves Jesus, and this is who he is, and this is what God made him to be. And it's, it's really frustrating for my uncle right now because my uncle is trying to love on his son who is, who is totally messed up in his mind, and I believe the world and Satan has twisted it and made it into something that has, has totally messed him up. 
And my uncle is trying to love on him in a way that is not a religious loving way. Because Jesus didn't do that. Jesus never said that, this, this, that the Sabbath wasn't good. He never said you should not honor the Sabbath. Because guess where he is on Sunday? He's in the tabernacle. He's in the temple. He's worshiping. That's where he is. Jesus mixes a blend of let's keep the religious rules, but let's also make sure that we don't destroy people's hearts and their, and their lives in the, in the process. Jesus is real big on that making sure that others are loved and make sure that they feel like that they are loved and cared about. I'm totally off my stuff. That's the Holy Spirit. There was, in the 1600s, there was an emperor of India. He lost his wife in a tragic, uh, by tragic disease. And his grief was so great that he decided to build the biggest temple he could possibly build that would serve as a tomb for her. So her coffin was put in the middle of a large piece of land, and the big temple was built all around it. You know what temple that is? Taj Mahal. The emperor was so determined to build the most magnificent temple for his wife that he would be obsessive about it. Weeks turned into months, and the emperor's grief that he had over his wife was overshadowed by his passion for the project. He was obsessed with the construction and every little detail about it. So one day, while he's walking from one side of the construction to the other side, he trips over a wooden box. And in his frustration, he orders that the box be thrown out. What he didn't realize was that that he had just ordered the disposal of his wife's remains. That story really bothers me. That story kind of haunts me because could somebody build an elaborate tribute to a hero and forget the hero? Maybe some of you are going, oh, whoa, oh, oh. I see what you're saying. Could somebody build such an elaborate building that they would completely forget the person and the reason why they built it? I think... I think that speaks home to some of us because there's a lot of churches that are beautiful. They're beautiful. Their construction is amazing. And you look at the architecture and the things that were put into it and the work that was put into it, the detail and the love that was put into it. And it was built to honor God. And they're empty. And Jesus is looking at these Pharisees and he's saying, you, you realize that you're just about religious things. You're, you're about the, the act of doing something and not the heart behind. You've forgotten the reason that you did it in the first place. So God gives these ten commandments, these ten rules of, of life to live by. And what do they do? These religious leaders, these religious people, they come up with 600 and, 613 different rules to explain the ten rules. That's what humans do. We do that as humans. We over, we, we like try to go above and beyond. Like those rules that God gave us were not good enough, so let's come up with some more rules to make it even harder to get to God so that the people that really need to get to God are pushed outside and the people that are important and the people that are religious and the people that are supposed to be. This Pharisees that were there on that Sunday that Jesus heals this man with a withered hand, This man has come in. Now, there's some religious books that have been lost, and some of the translation, there's a, a, I didn't know if you know, but there's a gospel to the Hebrews, a gospel to the Jews. And part of it is is destroyed, but there's part of it that we get, and we get this story. This man was actually a, a bricklayer, and he had come to the tabernacle, to the temple that day, to ask Jesus for help. To ask Jesus for help. Scripture says that he was not born with a withered hand. It happened to him as a result of life. Guess what the Pharisees see? Oh, what did he do? What did he he do to cause that? Jesus didn't care. Jesus didn't say, now, did you do that to yourself? Did somebody else do that to you? He didn't say that. Because he doesn't care. He saw the need. He saw the person behind it. 
He always does that, and he calls us to do that. So these religious leaders, they get about 613 rules that are so weird for the Sabbath, okay? Are you ready for some of these rules? It was so holy. They wanted the Sabbath to be a, to be a reminder of what God had done for them in Egypt, that he got them out of slavery, that he got them out of bondage. And so God says, when, Jesus, when, when God says to Moses, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, they want to go like to the extreme. Are you ready? It was taught that there couldn't be any work on the Sabbath. You couldn't shave. You could not ride horseback. If your ox fell in a ditch, you could pull your ox out. But if you fell in a ditch, you had to stay there. That's a for real rule, Jewish rule. Eggs that were laid on the Sabbath could not be eaten. Never mind that there are people that are starving right next door in the streets. And you're supposed to throw those eggs out. Because the hen had been working. <laughs> Poor hen. If a flea bites a person on the Sabbath, he must not scratch it. He must not, let, he must not kill the flea because that will be hunting. You have to let it bite in peace. One time a fire broke out in Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Three people were killed because nobody wanted to put the fire out. Because that would be considered working. You find it sad and odd that the very person who gives the Ten Commandments, who gives the Scripture, who gives that, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That was Jesus because Jesus is God, remember? Now Jesus, some thousand years later, standing in front of these people, God in flesh, right there in front of them, and guess what they're doing? They're nitpicking little things about the very law that he gave. And they completely miss it. I, th I think we, we do that. I, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe nobody in this room does that. I do that. I, I nitpick little things about Scripture and I nitpick my theology and make sure that if my theology makes sure it lines up with your... I've done that for years. I had friends in college who were in Bible college with me. We would debate and it would get into an argument. And if we were sitting in a, group, a room full of people who were non-believers, they would think that we hated each other because of our arguing about the Scripture. In fact, the, the, the lawyer that comes to Jesus, you know what they used to do? They would sit around, this group of, of, of leaders, of religious leaders, they would sit around and they would argue with each other which law, which one of the 613 laws was the best. And so that's why they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, you tell us which one's the best. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and that's it. And then they got mad. Because Jesus, who, who takes a law that was given years and years and years ago and brings it down and boils it down to, it's about you loving God and loving the person that is next to you. Now, how do you apply this? This, this scripture really wrecked my week because I think of myself. I'm a pastor. It's my job to study scripture. It's my job to prepare messages. It's my job to, to love on you people, even Rick in his muscle shirt. I had to bring it up again. And I'm, it's my job to, to do this, to study scripture, to come to church, to be here, to, to answer phones, to answer emails, to answer things like, you know, to be what Jesus wants me to be. And I drive past a couple that live not, I could throw a rock and hit their house, who don't know Jesus. I drive past their house before I get in my car to come here. I could talk to them. But I drive out my driveway and down the road to come here. And it wrecked me this week reading the scripture. Because I realized that I'm kind of pulling a Pharisee thing. There's people that live right beside of me who are going to die and go to hell. 
if they don't have Jesus in their heart. And Jesus looks at me and he says, okay, in this story, who are you? Are you the Pharisee who mouths off to the disciples? There's lots of people who have had that to happen to them. That's why they're not here today. Are you, are you the disciple who is being mouthed off to? Are you Jesus who wants people to see the greater need? The greater need is not a building. The greater need is not a service. The greater need is not these pews, is not this pulpit, is not this altar, is not this room, it's not any of this. The greater need is to love the people that our God puts in your life. Rick, the reason that the young lady is in your life, she's there for a reason. God wants you to speak to her, to speak truth and love into her heart. The, God, the reason that God put me in this house beside these people is because he wants me to show them a little bit of Jesus. And it is a sin for me to drive by them and not let them see Jesus on my way to church. Oh, man, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Because Jesus, I feel like he's talking to me as I'm driving down the, the, the road. I'm driving to church la this last week, and I'm like, Jesus is like, you know you're driving past people who need you just so you can get to church? It really wrecked my week. And I had to ask Jesus to forgive me because I was pulling a Pharisee move. I cared more about coming to a building than I did about the people who are living right next door to me that need Jesus. So I put this into your life. So I'm taking a little bit of the burden off of me. Who do you, who do you drive past? Who do you drive past on your way to be religious? You got neighbors, you got friends, you got people that you know are going to die and go to hell. You're thinking right now, I know your names are coming to your, you know, like faces are coming into your head right now. And you're like, yeah, yep, I know. Those people are the people that Jesus came for and he sends us into their lives for a reason. He turns our world upside down so that we live in a culture that says, this is how you should be happy and do whatever you want to do. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says that you love other people and you put them before yourself. And that's real convicting for me. Because i got to be Jesus to my neighbors who don't want to have anything to do with them. So I'm talking to my neighbor and he's the one that says to me, so you're religious. And I said, I hope not. I said to him, it's, it's not about religion at all. It's about relationship. I have a relationship with Jesus. And you know what he says? Really? Like he, he's never heard that before. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, Jesus is my best friend. And I said, he's my God. He tells me how to live life. And he shows me the way to live. And he shows me what to do. And when I do, don't do the things he wants me to do, he corrects me. And I said, I have a relationship with him. Really? His response is like so like childish. Really? Can we sit down together and have a talk? Because I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that before. There's no coincidence that Jesus put me right beside him. Not a coincidence at all. He put me in his life for a reason. And he has put you in people's lives for a reason. Jonathan, he brought you to this church last week for a reason. I love Jonathan came up to me after church last week, and we, were, we did the thing about the bread. And Jonathan then goes, I want some of that bread. And I'm like, dude, you can have the whole loaf. He's like, no, I don't want that bread. I want the bread you're talking about. <gasps> I was like, are you serious? So he, he and I sat up here for like a half hour, and we talked. And I told him, I was like, it's, I said, it's, it's about having Jesus in your life and letting him work through you and let him tell you where to go and how lead you. And he asked Jesus into his heart. There's, welcome to the family, brother. There's no coincidence. There's no coincidence that God has you where he has you. Don't let your religion get in the way of your relationship. If it is, then you need to dump your religion. Dump it. It's not going to get you anywhere, and it's not going to get the people in your life anywhere. 
It's going to get you into the place where you say, you shouldn't heal that person on the Sabbath. Jesus standing right there, God in human flesh, tells this guy to stretch his hand out and it completely heals this man. And guess what they do? They go outside and they get with the people who are the enemy, who would be their enemy, to kill Jesus. That's what a religious person does. Religion causes you to narrow your focus. Religion causes you to look at a single thing when relationship with Jesus causes you to see the bigger picture. The need that is going on all around you that you think is just coincidence. It's not a coincidence. God has put you in the place you are at for a reason. And that is to be his mouthpiece, his hands, his feet, to talk to the people who need to hear you and him the most. And we are walking right past them. We walk right by them so that we can do the religious thing. It's time to break religion and live in the upside down. Counter to culture and counter to religion. Jesus today, man, I'm wrecked by this story. Because it speaks to me and it says that I care more about the people that are in your life than I do about silly religious laws and rules and whatever. You want me to focus on the people that need me the most. The people who are going to die and go to hell if they don't hear about your love and your forgiveness. Jesus, help me to be your mouthpiece. When I don't know what to say, when I don't have the words to say, when I'm asked questions I don't know the answer to, please help me to have an answer. I know you will. You've done it before. Do not let religion get in our way as a church. Do not let religion come in front of the mission that you have called us to be, is to love you and to love other people around us. And it doesn't matter what they do or what they are, you call us to love. And sometimes love hurts. But it's what you call us to. Jesus, forgive us for the times that we failed you, for the times that I've driven past people that you've told me to stop and you've told me to say something to, and I ask you to forgive me for those times that I've let you down.